Live. We're on. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our live session today. Um, sorry, we're a bit uh, late. We've had some connection uh, issues with this webinar tool, which I think is not the only one having these problems these days. Um, so as you can see, all our panelists are here. Uh, great to have you guys on. Thanks a lot. Um, we've got quite a crowd. Uh, I think this is officially the uh, the record uh, for us in terms of attendance to a live session from Takiwaki. I'm trying hard to convince myself that it has nothing to do with the fact that for once, I will not be the only person speaking. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, I hope all is okay on your side. Uh, I hope your families, friends uh, are doing okay. Before we get started, just a bit of info about how this live session will work. So on the right, as many of you have already seen, uh, you actually have a chat tool. Now, the goal of this chat tool is really to do some Q&As between uh, you guys who are attending the session and us guys uh, on the panel. Um, so you can see it on the right or the left. I'm not sure, um, depending on your version. If you're on mobile, you can see it if you scroll down. Um, and the way we're going to try and handle that is I'm going to interview each uh, panelist at a time, and I'm going to try and pick up some questions at the end of each small interview. But then also at the end of the session, we'll try and do some more global uh, Q&A, if that's fine with you. Uh, also, one last thing, no need to take notes. Uh, for you guys, we'll be sending a the recording of the uh, the event right after. All right, so um, let's get started. As a quick intro, I'm Quentin. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Takiwaki. We're actually a company that specializes in building brand communities, uh, mainly for brands and retailers. Uh, now to do that, what we do is we uh, give advice on a community strategy to these clients, but we also build for them community platforms on their online store to basically gather, retain, and engage uh, their community. Um, so as we've been doing this over the last weeks, obviously a lot of our clients um, have been asking us and we've been counseling them on what to do with their community during the lockdown. Um, and this is actually what gave us the idea to organize uh, this Q&A. Um, now we thought it'd be more interesting if it wasn't us just describing what we saw, but if we actually found a way to get the brands that are doing some of that cool stuff to uh, uh, exchange with us uh, live. Uh, so we went out and tried to look at what we thought were the brands that were doing the best job of that. Uh, the ones that stood out because they actually reacted quickly and very efficiently to the situation. Um, so what we're going to do is have uh, a Q&A with these guys. So with me today, I actually have uh, Julia. Hi, Julia. Uh, so Julia is heading uh, social commerce at Monkey. Uh, Monkey is actually one of H&M's fashion brands who focuses mainly on Gen Z. I've got Emily um, and George. Uh, so Emily and George are actually uh, from the sole supplier uh, team. So they are one of the biggest UK websites for sneaker fans. Uh, George is actually the CEO and Emily is in charge of uh, digital marketing and acquisition. I've got uh, Lauren from Hobbycraft, uh, who's with us. Hi, Lauren. Uh, so Hobbycraft, in case you don't know them, they're one of the top UK uh, arts and craft retailers. And Lauren is the senior manager for social media and creative content there. And finally, uh, we've got Gabriel with us. So Gabriel is actually our uh, dedicated retail expert for this webinar, and she's the CEO of Solberry uh, Advisory. Also that you can't see, but working in the shadows, I have uh, Hannah, who's our marketing director, uh, who will be helping, uh, helping me and helping us with questions. Uh, so we're gonna dive right into the Q and A's. Uh, one last thing before we do that, I just wanna take some time to thank you guys uh, for being here, uh, everyone on the panel. Uh, thanks for taking the time to prepare the questions that we've sent you. Uh, thanks for sharing uh, what your brand is actually doing with other brands. And for those of you who had to fight with their PR department to actually be on here, uh, special thanks to. All right, so let's start with, uh, with you, Julia. Um, so you're in charge of social commerce at Monkey. Uh, full disclosure, you guys are actually our clients and we're working together uh, on your community. But the reason we wanted to chat with you today is really because even outside of the community, uh, you guys have been doing some really interesting stuff to try and keep your community uh, engaged during this period. So I guess um, first quick um, uh, question is, can you start by telling us basically how Monkey has been impacted by the uh, pandemic? Uh, well, of course, as uh, a lot of brands, we have uh, been heavily uh, affected. Um, by that, I mean, safety is our first priority and we carefully follow the latest recommendations made by the government and the relevant health authorities in each market. Uh, but as many retailers with physical stores, we have been impact, uh, impacted a lot. 
uh, and a lot of our stores in Europe are temporarily closed. Uh, okay. While our online store is operating pretty much as usual with little or no impact and is uh, performing really well. Okay, so no more, not a specific increase of traffic on that online store due to the closing of the stores? We, we have increased traffic on the online store. Okay. And in terms of uh, more engagement, so you guys are famous, at least to us and, and other people, for being really good in socials and engagement in socials. Uh, have you seen uh, more engagement from your community there? Is it staying the same? Is it decreasing? What was the effect of lockdown on uh, socials engagement? Um, well, there, there is a big impact on, uh, on it. Uh, we, we can see that uh, our online community is... Uh, increased in contact they are trying to connect with uh, with us and each other uh, and the activity in Monkesphere has increased a lot uh, during march and okay. uh, our community is always very very loving and uh, i think during these tough circumstances they are even more loving and uh, i see a lot of uh, positivity and uh, seize the day kind of uh, mentality in the community mm. Yeah, I think uh, it was one thing we looked at. Uh, I've seen one of the things you've been doing from the beginning, even for the first few days, is you've been polling uh, your communities and socials with, a, if I remember, it's quite a simple question, which is basically ask them what they wanted from your brand at that time. Um, so I think, in, in our opinion, this is really a best practice, uh, basically co-creating uh, what the communication is going to be in the next weeks and what they actually want to see from you. Um, can you explain why you chose to do that? Uh, and Basically, I mean, we, we were seeing some of the stuff on the on the screen, but what your community asked from you? Well, at Monkey, we've always had that kind of close relationship with our customers. So reaching out to them during these circumstances felt very natural. Um, and our community is such a big part of, uh, of what we do and how we do things. Um, and we always try our best to listen to them and to engage with them. Uh, because without them there is no monkey. Um, so what we do has to be relevant to them, of course. Uh, and the response that we got from the community was really clear. Uh, they still want fashion and they want positive things that can take their mind off this uh, very tough situation that they're facing. So in the end they kind of ask you not to talk about the coronavirus. Exactly. I'm guessing, yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. Uh, okay, and you did that on Instagram mainly? I mean, you guys are mainly on Instagram, isn't it, compared to like Facebook or emails in general? Um, no, we, we're on all, practically all social channels. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, and uh, we send out a lot of newsletters, and then of course we have the online community, Monkeysphere. Okay, and in general, I mean, based on the little answers that we saw in the polls, uh, how have you adapted uh, your communication based on these insights? Was it all about... Uh, sharing positive uh, uh, positive thoughts. Can you give us some examples of what you did? Well, we work really hard to to balance these messages during these uh, special circumstances, and we use our channels to inform them uh, and answer questions and how we act uh, as a company in this tough situation. Um, and and we also want to be responsive to that the situation is always changing. And at the mm. same time, we have got a lot of input directly from our community on what type of content they, they want to see, which means that we can adapt and deliver communication that is, that is really meet their request. Um, nice. For example, we have done uh, styling uh, competitions where you can create an OCD in the monkey sphere, which they really appreciate. Uh, and we've asked them to share their best advice on um, how to self-care, to uh, engage with them to take cute pictures of their furry friends and to share with us and also to show them the best comfy fashion to wear at home at the moment. All right, so it's really a dialogue uh, in the end. Yes, um, absolutely. Cool. All right, uh, any other actions that you're planning with the community uh, that you'd like to share or something around your, your main goal for these uh, coming weeks? Well, we will we will continue to focus uh, even harder to to encourage the discussion amongst our customers uh, by inviting them to discussion discuss certain topics in the monkey sphere on a regular basis, uh, and we really hope that we will build a safe place for them there uh, to connect to each other and uh, to us and to bring them closer to us. Okay. 
just as a legend, well, a explanation, the monkey sphere that you refer to is the, so it's the community platform that we've built together that's directly on your website. So the, the community. All right, one last question uh, on my side. Um, I mean, one of the really, one of the things that we really like about what you did is how fast you did it and how you're constantly pushing content, reacting to it and adapting. Um, so again, we haven't talked about that question before, so I don't know to what extent you're allowed to answer it, but internally, you can say pass. Uh, internally, have you seen the way that the teams work uh, start to like evolve because of this situation? Are you becoming more agile or was it something that you kind of had from the start? I think this has learned us to be even more agile than we normally are. Um, so yes, I think it's learned us as a company a lot in the, in the online team and in my role as social commerce. We, we have really adapted to the situation and uh, yeah, I think we're really agile. Um, cool. So it's really, it's really fun to see how it can impact the company in a positive way. Cool. Okay, I have one question from Joseph to ask you. Again, you always have the pass option. Uh, yeah. So how do you come up with the content calendar that you use or that you find relevant to the uh, community? Um, well, we have a, a really uh, a really good marketing department uh, that work with uh, both the Monkey Sphere and that works on the social channels. So I myself am not uh, responsible for doing all those great stuff but it's my colleagues. Uh, so yeah, they, they are really good. I, I don't know how they do it sometimes. They're really creative <laughs> well, I think, people. Yeah, I think on the content, one thing we see is you often, um, I mean, coming up with the content is that dialogue, isn't it? Is you ask people what yeah. they want, they tell you about pets, they tell you about loungewear, they tell you about stuff like that. And then the idea is how do you actually feature that content and get them to interact in the coming weeks around that content? And to answer Julie's question, so the monkey sphere that we've been working on was already actually launched uh, yeah, before the epidemic, a few months uh, before. So it was in monkey's vision before uh, everything happened. All right. So let's move over to a, the sole supplier with George and Emily. Um, so you guys, um, to us at least at Takiwaki, you're a great example of what we call a community first brand. Uh, kind of like close here in the US. It's kind of like you built yourself on that community. Uh, so that's why we wanted to have you uh, on this uh, on this chat. Um, George, as the, the CEO, can you give us like a super quick intro uh, to Soul Supplier for our attendees who don't know about you? Yeah, hello everyone. Thanks for watching. Um, the Soul Supplier is a website and app that helps people find footwear, the latest and greatest footwear from over a hundred retailers. And we do that with content, and we do that with search and comparison technology. So you can find the latest shoes with the latest prices and size availability from the latest retailers. Okay, awesome. Uh, so quick question also, uh, how have you been impacted uh, by the pandemic and lockdown? Yeah, I think around the March 23rd, when it really landed that the coronavirus was here, things were very volatile and people immediately held back on everything. And all of the retailers that we work with were seriously affected for two, three weeks. And they still are now because they've had to shut their stores. But the good thing is that they've moved a lot of their business online. And we're needed as a fully digital company more than ever to help talk about what they're doing online. And a community has been a big part of that right now. And I think Emily's going to talk more about that. But we've seen a lot more solidarity between people online um, as a result of this, people being more friendly, there's more communication. And we, we've done a few polls as well, like Julia said, just to ask people, what do you want to see? To really get them involved, that makes them feel better. So yeah, definitely was volatile, but it's leveled off a little bit now. So Emily, yeah, you're uh, you're basically the person behind the community uh, on a daily basis, and you've built the community, especially those Facebook groups, for years now. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about these? Uh, how what are these groups? How do you engage them? And how has engagement on these groups changed based on before and after the coronavirus? Sure. So these launched um, a few years ago now. Um, we have over sixty four thousand members in our Facebook community groups. Um, just using the groups function that Facebook has given us. Um, and they're reacting super, super well to content. They're getting involved more than ever. 
um, and taking a brief look into analytics, uh, we're around 24, 25% up on user posts, um, so user generated content as well, um, since pre COVID-19. Uh, so just sort of away from the numbers, I personally um, feel like there's been an overall increase in community spirit, uh, members making sure they're close circle within the community groups that they've made friends with, either virtually or they've managed to meet online, uh, meet in person from knowing each other online. Um, they're sort of supporting each other um, during this difficult time, helping each other out, um, get shoes and things like that. Um, one noticeable difference um, is that we've moved away from pushing and talking about uh, full price products necessarily. So we're shifting that focus onto um, discount events, which the retailers are feeding us. Um, so users are really still willing to sort of get involved in that, grab the latest steal, grab a bargain, because um, they've got that FOMO, so fear of missing out that this steal won't be available after COVID-19, so they still have to buy it anyway. Um, but they are getting themselves a genuine bargain. We're not just sort of pushing shoes down their throat. Like they, they genuinely do want these, these products, still, which is really cool. In terms of uh, content, um, so you're pushing content. Are the users creating content themselves? Are you working with them on creating content? Yeah, so it is led, uh, well, it is sort of about a year ago, it was the admin teams, we call them, so myself and a couple of others. Um, especially through the Facebook groups, it is creating, so it is user-generated content. Um, so, for example, on the left there, you can see somebody has spent his time doing up his room. It does look like a shop, but it did get... Uh, like over 560 likes, mm. loads of comments. Um, so people love that there. Um, I'm getting feedback from someone what, in there. I don't know if what I want to there. say about what Emily's done in these groups as well is she is the main go-to in the groups. You know, she is the person that knows about the industry, that's friendly, approachable, and that's creating the content. So she bridges the gap between the business and the groups and the community. And I think having that person or those community leaders is essential to making the group feel connected to the brand. That's about um, authenticity yeah. too, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So although the users, like you said, on the left are generating the content, I'm doing things. So on the right, I will create as best, I'm not as best content as I can at home. Um, so I'll touch on it later, but we've been letting people team up making gaming tournaments and meeting up on the Animal Crossing worlds and things like that. So it's not all sneaker related. It, mm. um, sort of branching out to those other directions as well, which has really, really helped. Um, so yeah, they've got more time than ever to engage in discussion, create um, indoor content and share that with the community. Okay, cool, cool. Can you actually tell us more about the Animal Crossing part? Yeah. I'm curious <laughs> <laughs> I can do. Um, so basically it was a game way back in, in our childhood, I guess. Um, and it's just released on the Nintendo Switch and everyone's gone crazy for it. You can you can create your own sneakers and designs within Animal Crossing itself. So that's where the crossover is. Um, people have really jumped on that publications and things like that. So we've decided to do that within the groups. But same with Call of Duty, like the boys are making their own tournaments and things like that. I'm hosting Animal Crossing parties in my, in my <laughs> town, you know. So it's my, the main thing about this is it's not just a sneaker focus, it's, it is a community overall. Uh, so they're really getting involved, even in these off-topic discussions. It's just creating a sense of normality, really. Even though they are our customers, they're our users, we're not just trying to make money out of them. Like, it's building that loyalty. Um, and people do make genuine friendships from it. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, yeah. we guys meet up every week uh, when, before this um a lot of guys from the groups meet up in selfridges and in east london when there's that when there's uh, collection days for shoes and like emily said people made good friends online that then turn into real real friends which is just it's amazing to me you know i've I've been part of this as well and it's really cool yeah it is really cool. yeah it's something whichever community we built on takiwaki we always find that thing that the second that people actually make friends online they're actually a lot more likely to come back to the platform. And the second they actually meet these guys in real life, then you've got them on the platform for life. So it's yeah. it's, uh, it's really cool to have you confirm that. Sure. Um, okay, so as a quick recap, I guess, Emily, uh, in terms of channel, what's performing best uh, these days for you guys? Um, so I guess two main things in the community groups um, that are, it's revolving around our team being super friendly. Like I say, keeping that normality during the crisis. Um, so like we've touched on briefly is, um, really encouraging off-topic conversations um, so people can host gaming tournaments, etc., just to keep themselves busy, keep their minds busy, stay healthy, etc. Secondly, again, we've spoken about the discount um, thing, pushing towards those and promoting those and helping people get that steal. If we don't mind moving on to the Instagram slide, 
Um, so across Instagram, uh, this has worked super well. So we've been encouraging people to use various hashtags, such as hashtag stunting from home, um, hashtag stay in and flex um, for their chance simply to be reshared on our story. That that means a lot to our community, which is is lovely. And it's it's not e well, I guess it's an easy way for us to just kind of get the word out there because more people are sharing it in the hope that we will share them. Uh, we've also added on the stay at home um, tag again to increase reach. Um, at the peak of this, we actually achieved 718 um, K story impressions in a single day, um, which is was pretty big, but at the moment we're 48.7% um, on average up on story impressions since pre-lockdown. Um, so yeah, we haven't needed to do anything crazy. It's simple, getting the community involved. Um, allowing everyone wants to show off their latest sneaker purchase if they haven't been able to buy something recently then they can show off their collection um whatever they fancy and also george has been doing um some things on his personal accounts yeah yeah so i've been just generally aiming to inspire people to to make the most of their time at home and let them realize that you can be positive and make the most out of your situation even if it's a bad situation so live streams answering business questions video content um stories answering everyone's dms that message me and just generally trying to keep people positive in this tough time is my responsibility right now yeah cool awesome uh, so i might come in and ask you a few business questions myself that's what I mean. <laughs> Uh, no, it's really cool to do that. Okay, good. And uh, well, I guess last question for you, um, Jordan. Uh, how do you find, are you able to identify how the fact of actually having a community has um, influenced the way that you guys are going through this period? I think it keeps us as a company grounded in a way because we get to get real live feedback from people and understand where we're going wrong and more about the market. And I think that by building all the foundations over the last three years, like you said, where people have actually made not just online friends, but real friends, it means that they understand we're more than just, like Emily said, a brand that wants to make money. And we are involved in our users. You know, our goal on, on our social platforms is to try and answer all DMs that we get, really try and engage on comments and replies. And it's, it is, it has proven to pay off for us and, I've made so many friends from this business and, and so many people that I respect the right. So you can't beat it, honestly. I'm, uh, I'm seeing a question from uh, Josephine here, which kind of goes in the direction that you were going. Um, and her question is basically, as you're doing that, how do you not get taxed of like opportunism? Uh, how do you make sure that people are not seeing you as profiting from the situation? I think part of your answer is, well, because you're helping out people is that is that the, the the idea yeah i think just quickly from my side on the facebook groups people in there they're hardcore sneakerheads they are going to buy shoes no matter what i mean obviously the financial situation of everyone isn't ideal right now therefore we've turned the focus like i say onto the discounted um products however we're still not really forcing people to buy so for example on the instagram we're just allowing people to show their purchases or their show their collection um they don't have to buy anything to do that it's just anyone can sort of get involved same with the the gaming stuff and the off-topic bits like anyone spending nothing can still get involved in that yeah the, the community is not the we're not selling the community is not used to sell the yeah. community is used for the community and we don't use that our dms and our replies to sell we use them to engage and talk to people um if you want to buy shoes and you want to learn more about them with the intention of buying then maybe you'll visit the website and use the search and comparison tool. But the platforms that we use are used for the right purposes, which is to inform, engage and inspire people, really. Yeah, yeah I think uh, as a company, Talkie Walkie, we can answer that question ourselves too. Uh, as we saw the, um, the COVID spreading, uh, and obviously we're doing a community chat, we're doing community platforms, community has a role to play. So part of us were going, oh, we need to talk to everyone and every prospect and every client about how great our solution would be in those times. And then we were also like, this is not the right time to do it. We don't want to have that image of ourselves. And I think this webinar is a good example where we thought, all right, what content can we create at that time that doesn't sound like us selling ourselves when we shouldn't be? 
so that's also one of the big reasons where we said the condition for us doing a webinar now about COVID is if we get other people talking about what they're doing. And so basically we're genuinely trying to do stuff to help brands and not us selling. So I think it's all about um, basically creating content that's helpful, not to you, but to your customers to some extent, or at least try. Right. Um, okay. Uh, cool. We're going to move to Hobbycraft. I'm seeing a couple of questions that if that's all right with you, we'll keep for uh, for the end. Um, so in the case of Hobbycraft, uh, Lauren, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, so you're in charge of creative content and social media at Hobbycraft. Um, so you're one of the top arts and crafts stores in the UK. And uh, with you guys, I'd actually like to focus on how you've actually been helping parents to keep their kids busy at home with like daily craft projects. Um, you know, one could argue you guys are the real heroes here. Um, but so my question was basically at the start of lockdown, we've been seeing, we were following you closely and we've seen you launch what you call a daily kids craft club. Uh, could you tell us more about that? Sure. Yeah. So the kids craft club is a daily dose of inspiration for parents um, to try and keep their kids entertained um, during this time. So encouraging them um, to into um, community participation because um, they might feel quite isolated at the moment. Um, so it's a forum for sharing creativity um, and for kids to maintain positivity um, at this challenging time. And it's worth noting that Kids Craft Club is one of eight of our key crafts that we focus on. Um, so we're also doing lots of work with our knitters, artists, paper crafters, etc. But we're focusing in on on kids at the moment, and it's it's doing really really well. So every day at 11 a.m. we share a new craft theme, and um, we would encourage people to share um, what they've been making. Um, this goes across Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and it provides hints and tips for how they can get creative. Um, so it's encouraging the community to share with us, and then we will in turn share their creations with our community. And it's kind of it kind of snowballs from them, really. Hmm. So I think one cool mechanism that I see, aside from the great idea and the uh, genuine need for people to find stuff for their kids to do, um, one of the things that I find really cool also is that what you're saying is you're basically it's going two ways. You're helping people build stuff, but when they actually craft and build, you're actually showcasing what they're doing to the rest of the community. Mm -hmm. So there's, again, there's just like back and forth, um, um, kind of like dynamic that I think is very important. Um, one quick question. So basically this was in the end, this was something that you had set up before uh, and that, that, that you just insisted on, or did you create it for the situation? So we have a, um... We, um, our in-store workshops are called our Kids Craft Club. So obviously when all our stores closed, we, we wanted to kind of bring that fantastic community feeling that we get within our stores with our fantastic colleagues onto social media. And um, we're, we're quite lucky because we've got a huge um, library of ideas in our Ideas Hub, which is our online blog. So we were able to pull from those and highlight those each day um, for Kids Craft Club. And we also have a fantastic community of independent crafters, um, mummy bloggers who work with us and who were so excited about sharing what they're doing every day with their kids with us. We were able to um, get video content, Instagram takeovers, how to posts, all using stuff that these parents had at home anyway. So there wasn't a pressure on, oh gosh, I can't make that because I don't have pipe cleaners or something. It's all projects that are quite easy to um, pull together from your craft stash. So we pulled from our Kids Craft Club um, into workshops and we've kind of renamed it and reimagined it in an online setting. And it's working really, really well. Cool. Have you, um, so these kind of like, uh, when we build communities, these kind of uh, online events at regular hours is something we really push on our community platforms because we know that's how you create a retention and regular people coming back. Is it something you're thinking of keeping after whatever happens later? I think so. I think, because um, generally our, our kids um, content is a small part of what we do. And obviously at this time we've seen it balloon and kind of take over. Um, but I can definitely see a place for it in the summer holidays and half terms 
and things like that. So I'm, I'm thinking we would definitely want to, to use it definitely going forward. Cool. Any other uh, actions that you're planning next with your community or other stuff that you're working on at the time? Yeah, so um, obviously we've been focusing on um, our kids um, category, but um, because we had so many different ideas and we have so many different craft verticals that we focus on, um, we wanted to pull something together for everybody else. So we launched on Monday our hashtag craft together. Um, campaign and this runs alongside Kids Craft Club. It's actually at three o'clock every day and each day we have a different craft prompt and um, so Monday it's all about Monday motivation so we would encourage people to share their motivational um, craft mantras. Um, Tuesday we introduce a new project that they can get started in. On Wednesdays we ask them to share their work in progress with us um, Thursdays is a throwback to some archived content. So this week we're showing a video of um, unicorn bunny eggs. <laughs> um, Friday we do a takeover from a, one of our prominent crafters. And Saturday we just have some fun and do craft bingo. Um, so we've got something different each day. Um, but it's, it's looking really good. Obviously we're only on, what day is it today? Thursday. We're on our throwback Thursday today. Um, and then on Sunday, we'll just look at all the content that our community has shared with us and create a gallery and share it with them in turn. Cool. Okay. Uh, well, thanks a lot. Uh, I see time is passing by quickly. So we're going to get to the, uh, the conclusion with uh, Gabrielle. Uh, Gabrielle, you've been dropping in and out of connections quite a couple of times. So I can't guarantee that we're going to get through it. But I hope so, because you had some, some cool insights um, to share. Um, now, um, basically, to give a bit of insight about you, so you're the CEO of Solberry Advisory. Um, you're the retail expert here. Um, and basically, you've got extensive experience in retail, especially helping brands uh, launch and ac accelerate their e-com, but also working on customer experience. Um, so I had a few questions that I wanted to ask you, maybe as a recap of what we've been saying. Um, We've been focusing a lot of, on the do's, so what you need to do these days. I was wondering if you have any advice on the don'ts, so things that people must be careful about, things that they should be um, extra mindful of not doing during these times. I think you're on mute. We can't hear you. All right. One thing we can do, if you want, is can you type... Um, yeah, Hannah, can you try to get in contact with Gabrielle? Try and see if we can find another way. And in the meantime, uh, I'll try and look at the, the questions uh, we've been leaving for now, because we can't uh, hear anything, Gabrielle, on our side. Um, OK, so um, one of the questions we got was basically, the panelists have been talking about groups and the groups that you have. Um, one of the questions was, what are, where are these groups on? Um, so there's Facebook, there's Instagram. Uh, do you guys have any WhatsApp groups, for instance, any other uh, platforms that you're using? So ours are on Facebook, both of our groups, and Instagram for us. On our page, our community is pretty strong as well. But our community exists on uh, Facebook. But our goal over the next three months with our development team is to integrate the community onto the site. The website, yeah, on the app. Cool. Um, Emily, did you want to add anything? Um, no, just reiterating what George says, to be honest. Although the, the strong community focus is on Instagram and obviously the two Facebook groups, um, one of them is actually a marketplace group. So we've got a marketplace group and our uh, rumors and news, so community group. And so we've got two of those working alongside each other. Um, yeah, they're the, they're the main the main two platforms for community really. And um, actually, saying that some of those, although we don't um, uh, we don't put them together, some mini communities, like I say, have have got, uh, grown from that. They've made their own WhatsApp groups, they've made their own Facebook groups. And although we don't have direct control over them, if some we post something, say for example, in the Facebook group, within two minutes someone's put it in the WhatsApp group anyway. So they kind of do that job for us, which is good. It's good. Yeah. All right, uh, Lauren, Julia. Anything to share on that? Uh, we use um, Facebook. Facebook is our largest community and Instagram is growing. So in the last three weeks, um, our daily follower base has doubled um, each week, um, So, which is fantastic. And also Twitter. Um, normally, we have our, all our 100 stores have their own Twitter account, um, but we've seen great engagement 
um, on the brand detection of the loop. Okay, we're going to give Gabrielle another try. I can't hear. Ah, I can hear you now. Can we? Yeah. I can't hear. <laughs> uh, it's never going to work in both ways, is it? Um, so, Julia, on the monkey sphere, you were saying. Yes, we're trying to like gradually move our community from Instagram to the monkey sphere, or at least our most dedicated customers to get them there. And that is something that we really see uh, during the past few months. That they are really trying there, trying to they're trying to get it, they're getting into that community, and really being engaged and uh, answering a lot of uh, questions uh, to each other, which is really fun to see. We have a, a really, really strong online community, so it's 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 really fun. And they share also they also even if they like to do these kind of virtual outfits uh, in the monk sphere, they also take a lot of uh, pics of them of themselves during under our hashtag hashtag monkey style. And uh, that was quite interesting to see uh, when I looked at the the stats earlier that um, you could think that the outfits should decrease when people are are in lockdown and in quarantine but they we actually have the same amount of uh, outfits coming in throughout uh, march uh, just a shift in how they look so in the beginning it was kind of pre-spring everything was fine and then in the middle of of march everything shifted and then we see a lot of uh, like selfies in the mirror, <laughs> a lot of socks, <laughs> a lot of people hiding their faces because they don't put makeup on anymore. <laughs> All right, cool, cool. Yeah, I think one of the things that you have with the community is you've got this community chat, which allows shoppers to uh, talk to one another. Uh, another of our clients, uh, which I think is a good example in cosmetics and beauty, uh, one of the things they're doing with the chat is instead of having the community talk to the community, they're actually using the chat every day between four and six um, to have people answer their questions from makeup artists. So I think another way that you could use your community, especially on your website where you're actually closer to conversion, is getting these people to chat with some of your staff or some experts uh, is another thing of the same, another media that we've seen use. All right, cool. So let's, uh, let's wrap it up with one last question. Um, the question I did see here was uh, basically, we've been talking about the increase of engagement, but I guess one question that comes naturally with that is, are you guys able to link that increase in engagement to an increase in sales or to an impact in conversion uh, in general? I can give you an example of how engagement, engagement outwards, so replying to comments, DMs, and liking people's stuff, you know, actually what the platforms are meant for, how that can affect your own engagement on the content that you're posting. Um, if you're not engaging back, it's very unlikely that you're going to get long-term engagement on your stuff. So if you just use that, you could say most likely that long-term that is going to mean an increase in sales, but it's not something we measure. It's very hard, but, but the point is, it's a give to receive, you know? Mm. All right. Mm. Any other feedback? Anyone else? Cool. Uh, okay, great. Uh, well, we're getting to the end. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what we'll do with Gabriel, if that's okay, um, is uh, basically ask you the questions that we have uh, separately through email. And at the end, uh, you'll get the recording of this session, but we'll also send you a recap of the main points that we've been talking about. And if that's okay with Gabrielle, we'll ask her to maybe add her own recap, answer her questions, so that we always get that content. Um, okay, cool. So thank you everyone for your time. Uh, if you don't have anything else to add, um, I'm good on my side. Thanks everybody, stay safe, bye guys. So hello again, everybody. We had some connectivity issues at the end of our Q&A session uh, yesterday. And so unfortunately, uh, we couldn't hear from Gabriel. You were uh, kind enough to take some time today uh, to share your thoughts, maybe share a quick recap of what we heard and go back over you know, some of the questions we had. So thanks so much, Gabriel. I think so. um, I'm sorry about yesterday and, uh, and, and here's hoping that tech, tech works today. <laughs> it seems like it's working so perfect. Um, so. As uh, Quinton was saying, and let's start off right there, we heard a lot from Monkey and the Soul Supplier and from Hobbycraft on what to do to stay engaged to your customers today, how to communicate. What are some of maybe the don'ts uh, right now in terms of brand communication? I think the the don't, the big don't is really um, about 
don't strike the wrong tone. It's really, really about finding what that what your voice is. A lot of brands have their voice. So, so such as the brands that that we heard from, they have a they have a really strong, good voice. Other brands, uh, particularly legacy brands, might not have that direct to consumer voice as strong. And so, it's very important that right now that tone is is really, really specific. It's very tricky, and this is where you've got to you've got to err on the side of caution. Um, so what you don't want to do is act like nothing's wrong. So I've seen lots of communications where it's just business as usual and actually nobody feels that it's business as usual. And so to pretend otherwise is, is, uh, strikes the wrong note. Um, on the other hand, going, going overboard with being nothing, nothing, but you know, that the situation we find ourselves in is is maybe a bit overkill so it's tricky but you just have to be be cautious but really striking getting that tone right and ask ask people ask your employees ask some of your customers road test it um th that's really the best advice and, and that's where companies are going wrong is that they're they're not getting that tone right so that come that goes back to what monkey has been doing polling their community and actually asking them what they want and, and hearing from their customers that actually they want positivity right now and positive news about this current situation. So that's right. They want positivity, but within the context of, hey, we all realize the situation we're in and we're not going to ignore it. And then something we uh, spoke about when we were, uh, you know, going back and, for uh, and forth about this session is that you, you and I both really like the tone that some brands and retailers um, mm -hmm. are striking when it comes to creating educational and helpful content. Um, what are some of the great examples that you've seen? Can you share a little bit more about that? Sure. So some of the businesses I, I work with, and actually uh, what you heard on the panel is anyone right now who has any content whatsoever to appeal to children is a huge winner, um, a really big winner. Parents, uh, you'll be in, in parents' hearts forever if you can help them manage <laughs> their children uh, during lockdown. Um, so some of the brands I've worked with, such as the School of Life, do, do a brilliant job at, at repurposing the content that they've been publishing all along to really address some of the issues that are top of mind right now. So you've got things like resilience, um, children, a lot around how to, how to keep your kids happy and, and serving it up in a way that really speaks to exactly what we're going through. Mm. I work with the Tate, the galleries, and the Tate has seen a massive increase in traffic to its um, children's uh, area on the website. And, and they've, I, I mean, just in the doubled the traffic in, to all the kids. And so while the Tate has always had really great content, they've really increased the amount of content, quizzes and, and user-generated content and, um, and to, to engage both on the website as well as on social channels. And it's not just with kids. So what they're doing is, um, is just what Monkey uh, w was doing as well and what, what some of the other brands are in that they're taking this time to really reply to the people who are on social. So social engagement in, uh, I mean, Tate reaches 10 million people uh, on social and it is, it, it's grown, I think in March, Instagram grew 50% and it's, it's people are really, really flocking to engage in that. So now we have time to actually be much more, um, to reply mm -hmm. much more frequently and, and really deepen that engagement and that conversation. So it's two way. Um, and those are some of the brands doing some lovely things. Okay. And do you see most brands creating new content or actually uh, reutilizing and recycling content they already had? Both. Both. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's uh, a lot of brands do create good content and, and maybe they don't give it as much of an airing as they should. Or um, it, you know, it's like any campaign, you launch it and then you launch something else. So I would argue, I would urge brands to really look back into their archives and find what content they've already created that could be applicable, as well as create new. Um, this doesn't mean you have to throw a ton of money at a whole new content stream. It's really about um, getting something out there that is valuable, that's short, sharp, quick. I mean, the Tate had a lot of content, but they've also created a lot more. And it's in the form of short form quizzes. Um, mm -hmm. It's engaging the audience to send in pictures of artworks that their children or that they have created. And, and really, a lot will come from your community. So you don't have to create it all yourself. Um, 
So it, it's a combination of both. Okay, super interesting. Um, what do you think this will change uh, for brands going forward? Like, it feels like such a um, historical momentous event. Mm -hmm. So do you think there will be like an actual pre and post COVID time? Or will it go back eventually to business as we knew it? I don't think it'll go back to business as we knew it. I think what this has done is accelerate changes that were already happening. I think that um, the the idea that we hold brands to a higher standard now than we ever did before um, in terms of how they treat first their employees, then their supply chain, and third, their customers, uh, that's been happening, but slowly. And now I think it's it's been accelerated um, hugely. And so how people spend their money and with whom is, is really, uh, it, it, there's a much higher bar now for, for people and they're choosing where they spend that money much more carefully according to their own ethics and how they perceive these companies are, um, are managing their own ecosystem, like, like we just said. So that, and that I think is a, is a wonderful change. Uh, and, and that will really force brands who don't already have a dialogue with their customers to get one and mm -hmm. to be, to really highlight transparency and authenticity. And some brands aren't going to be comfortable with that. And they're not going to know how to do that in an authentic way. And they may not have a story that really supports that. And, and those brands are going to go away. And I think the brands that, that, that do have a dialogue, and it isn't just the digitally native brands. Uh, it is, it, there's opportunity here for brands that have been around for a long time to come out uh, and really highlight what, is, what are the founders' stories? Um, what, what, what are the stories that the employees bring to the table? Let's talk about our customers and highlight who our customers are and let our customers talk to each other and our advocates. So it's really about where you put the focus. So I think that's going to be the new normal, um, and I and I welcome that change. And I think that the uh, the focus on content and community, really engaging your community, which has been happening for some time, is is going to be a much bigger focus moving mm -hmm. forward. There are brands out there that have the the luxury of appealing to a, a millennial crowd who are more more about that anyway. Um, the challenge lies for, uh, brands that might be new to this and might not necessarily be comfortable with a whole lot of transparency or, or know what their real brand values are. And they, it's not too late for them though. So I think they just need to, um, take the advice of, of what some of the brands were doing and which I've seen other brands do, which is really listen, ask and listen to what your customers say. And it's okay to ask. You know, we, we've seen the examples of, of the panel as well as, um, you know, the, the Tate and some of the others are, are posting on Instagram. They're, they're posting on, on their channels and saying, hey, how do you do you think that we should be doing this? Um, and I also think that putting yourself brands are, are have to put themselves in the context and the mindset of the customer now more than ever. So one really great example I saw, this is from a company called Surplus. And they're a menswear designer, and they're based in London. And they um, sent, like a lot of like, like a lot of brands, they create a catalog, and they had this catalog already shot and created before lockdown. Mm -hmm. And they mailed the catalog, but what they did is they sent an email first and said, "Listen," and this was from the founder. Uh, we're we did a catalog. We're sending it to you, and we don't. We we really apologize if this is in any way. Um, insensitive if you perceive this to be insensitive and if you think that we're that we're striking the wrong tone uh and and aren't aren't um acknowledging the environment we're in actually we were very considered we took a long time to decide that we should go ahead with sending it and here are the reasons why and uh we just hope you enjoy it and see it in the in the in the spirit in which it's intended and um please don't take offense and and we are we're here for you and it made me look forward to getting the catalog. And I thought, oh, good for them. They are a business. We want them to stay, we want them to stay alive and stay around. And so it's okay to, to still advertise your wares, but it is about that framework of that direct communication, which I think is, is really brilliant. You're going to see a lot more of it. Okay. Really interesting. And just to uh, jump back on something you said earlier about 
you know, some brands having the luxury of um, um, talking to a millennial audience or in the case of Monkey, Gen Z. Um, we've actually been seeing uh, the same kind of engagement with older audiences for some of our brand communities. Like we work in mm -hmm. France, we've been, working, we've been working for five years on uh, one of the biggest phishing uh, websites uh, in France. So oh, they yeah. have, they're, they're, they're a pure player and they have like 5 million visitors per, uh, per month. It's huge. Wow. And so their community is mainly a little older, I'd say, um, mostly men as well, not, not mm -hmm. only, but still, uh, mm -hmm. and they're super engaged. Um, and we see the same thing on like several knitting communities than for more for an older female audience. So I, I definitely agree with you that it's not just for some brands and it's, it's cross industry, cross audience and, uh, and cross demographics as well. And what you also have uh, as well with the knitting and with fishing, those are very specialized audiences anyway. And so they're already very engaged, which is brilliant. And you're right. It, it is not necessarily generational, but it is about what's the activity that they're doing and how, how much do they value the advice that they get from the community in the first place. And you're enabling that. And, and I'm not surprised that it's, it's so, um, that it's really taken off. I think that's that's brilliant. And there are lots of, and I think what, what this will also demonstrate is where those other pockets of affinity lie and where what the tapping into those niche that aren't small. Those are those are some very powerfully large communities. 